It's one thing to listen to doom and gloom about food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. It's quite another thing to hear practical, immediately actionable advice from experts who can help you reduce the fear, anxiety, and burden of these problems. Tune in now to the Surviving Hard Times podcast from the Finding Genius Foundation with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Surviving Hard Times podcast, sponsored by the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Robert Twilley. He's a professor, he's a vice president of the Office of Research and Economic Development at Louisiana State University. And we're going to talk about what's called global blue carbon estimates of mangroves and the role of nature based on well, the role of nature in climate change. So, Robert, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Tell me a brief background on yourself and then uh, how you got to study the area that you're in right now. Yeah, well, I did my master's degree at East Carolina University in Eastern North Carolina. And that's where, with Mark Brinson, I really got into wetlands. And I and we had a really interesting study on the Chowan River. And that led to a PhD opportunity at the University of Florida, where I really had the pleasure of working with some great ecologists and Ariel Lugo was my advisor, where I started working on mangroves. And then I was a participant in the systems ecology program that H.T. Odom had set up there, where, you know, we were thinking through the, the idea of ecological engineering. It was just a fabulous time to be in Gainesville. And my mangrove work was on carbon. I like to say that I did a carbon budget of mangroves in South Florida before carbon was blue. And so, but at that time, it was analyzed carbon because of the significance of mangroves to food web. We were trying to identify exactly how much carbon flux out of the mangroves contributed to the food webs, you know, the fisheries in the region. What does that mean, blue? I mean, what what do these colors have to do with Well, you know, it's the blue carbon. When carbon turned blue is this idea of how ecosystems on the surface of the earth could mitigate the CO2 increase that had been pretty well established with measurements out in Hawaii that we were seeing a very significant increase in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere as a result of fossil fuel and cement and et cetera. And so that anthropogenic CO2 signal in the atmosphere, there were questions, well, how do how does nature, what's the role of nature on you know, to sequester that carbon dioxide and store it permanently. When I say permanently, a hundred year life cycle. And blue was specifically looking at coastal ecosystem and the ocean. What's the role of those ecosystems in contributing to or possibly contributing to mitigating the CO2 increase in the atmosphere? What was interesting, I, I, I'll tell you a quick little story. In 1992, or actually it was around 1990 that my paper was published in 1992. Around 1990, 1991, I attended a conference in Bad Harzburg, Germany, where was a, all the major carbon researchers on all the major biomes around the world. We met in Germany to construct one of the first global carbon budgets of ecosystems. And the significance of that meeting, again, was prompted by the 
fact that we're seeing the CO2 increase in the atmosphere. And wanted to make sure that, you know, conservation of these ecosystems were very important because they contributed to this carbon sequestration and carbon storage process. And my job was to to develop budgets of wetlands and globally. But specifically, I wrote a, a paper in a book that was published in 1992 as a result of that conference on the first global carbon budget of mangroves. And in that paper, we actually estimated how much carbon mangroves globally were sequestering in soil and in the wood. And so that's the sort of the first benchmark and published in 1992 of a global carbon budget for mangroves. What does that mean, a, a carbon budget? Whose budget is it? What do you mean? Yeah, well, it's, it's, when I say budget, it's pretty much like your checkbook. You know, you budget out what your earnings and you budget out your cost and your wealth is pretty much what you've got left. We do the same thing when we do budgets of carbon, say for mangrove. We add up all the carbon that's going into, when I say into a mangrove ecosystem, a lot of that's by photosynthesis. So when you, see the green canopy of a tree every day. CO2 is being absorbed from the atmosphere by the leaves of the tree and stored in wood and some of that carbon. And each year that tree trunk increases in diameter. So there's a every year an an annual increment increase in carbon dioxide that gets stored in wood. And then some of that carbon ends up moving from the leaves and the canopy down into the roots. That builds what we call the soil organic carbon, which is, you know, the in each year there's an increment increase that carbon. And so then you have to calculate how much carbon you lose by respiration. One of the big factors is how much carbon do you lose by export because the tides come in, they pick up some of that carbon, they take it out into the estuary. So you add up all the inputs, you add up all the outputs, and what's left is your net ecosystem production, or what I will describe as the net carbon sequestration. And again, just like your checkbook, as I define the wealth is the difference between what you make and what you spend. A carbon budget of mangroves is the difference between the carbon input and the carbon output. That difference is how much is stored or sequestered each year in a mangrove forest. Oh, so what's the, um, is there a metric like each mangrove tree sequesters X amount or, you know, what did you find? Yeah, that's a really good question because that has been, I think, one of the really, our lab over the years has improved the budgets because when we first started, there's two major measurements that we use to to uh, estimate the total carbon storage or carbon sequestration in mangroves around the world. One is, just like I talked about the increment of wood growth, right? You got to know, all right, how much does the mangrove tree add to the wood or how much is the increase in the diameter of an of an average tree and an average forest globally and that's one of your metrics of carbon sequestration and basically in 1990 or in the paper in 1992 we only had gosh we only had 15 measurements globally so we took those 15 measurements and extrapolated it to what it would mean on a global basis the second measurement is you know how much does the soil increase in elevation? That's the the increment that is the amount of carbon it it stores each year. And believe it or not, soils in mangroves they increase you know two to three millimeters, or let's say you know a tenth of an inch every year, and that that increase is an increase in carbon that gets stored in those mangrove soils. Again, a lot of that increases because they're pumping carbon down into the roots and that is what's building that soil and we only have you, probably 20 compare a mangrove tree to another tree they're totally different they're totally different and the density it's really important that why would they take measurements from other trees and average this or that i mean who knows even what the average is like can you tell like again how much based on the circumference of a mango tree and the height and the foliage uh how much it would sequester or no yeah, you can. That's exactly right. And we and so we would calibrate what a certain size tree. In fact, we even did did it by what we call size class. We took the measurements that we had globally, we put them in different size classes of trees, and we then we took global statistics of what the size classes of trees look like across the in different regions. And we and that's exactly how we took a few measurements and extrapolated it to what the total 
carbon storages in a tree. Did the same thing with soils. We knew we had 25 or 30 measurements of soils. We knew exactly what the growth rate was in those soils. And we came up with an average of 200 grams of carbon per meter square per year of soil carbon storage. And then we just took the area of mangroves globally, and that gave us a number for the total soil carbon storage for mangroves. So thus, we came up with a number relative to the total carbon, which was 56 teragrams of carbon per year. That was the global measurement um, of mangrove carbon sequestration. So what is the idea here? Is that X amount well, of mangroves would so, be planted if, you, if, if an area had particularly high outputs of carbon? Or like what would, what's the goal of this? Yeah, project? so two things. One is we also look at the total carbon that's stored in the soils and in the trees. And two perspectives here. One is you want to conserve the mangroves you have because they are contributing to removing CO2 from the atmosphere at a rate of 73 teragrams per year of CO2. Now, that number has changed, and I can talk about that in a second. That number's gone up with our most recent analysis. But the other part of, the, of why carbon in mangroves is important is because besides the fact that they remove a certain amount of carbon per year, and you want to conserve, you want to preserve that, those mangroves, because they're helping you clean the air, right? They're every day free of charge. They don't charge us to do this. They remove 73 teragrams of carbon per year and help clean the atmosphere. Now, the second part of the story is these are also the soils and the wood. Mangroves have are big storages of carbon. They have a lot of carbon in all those trees and a lot of carbon in the organic matrix of those soils. And if you go in and damage a mangrove forest, if you build a shrimp pond and you cut down and you burn all those trees and you dig up all that soil and that carbon gets exposed back to the atmosphere, well, now you're not removing carbon from the atmosphere. You're actually now contributing, just as you do with fossil fuels, to the carbon CO2 increase in the atmosphere. So the key here is that we, you know, keep these landscapes intact so that they provide the service of cleaning air and not destroying them because you're releasing these huge storages of carbon that end up back into the atmosphere and contributing to climate change. Okay. You know, that makes sense. Well, mangroves in particular, where can they be put and where can't they be put? I believe they're in swamps, right? Right. These are wetlands. There's a reason we call them wetlands. The soils are wet for a large part of the year. They're, and for mangroves, they're also you know, adapted to salt. So wherever you have water that's flooding these lands for a large part of the year, and that water has salt, that's where you'll find mangrove. So they're on coastal shorelines around the world. Oh, a third dimension, third very important that I should have mentioned, is that they are not resistant to frost. So they're found in tropical and subtropical and also warm temperate regions. We have them here in Louisiana. And because our frequency of frost has been decreasing, so our mangroves have been expanding. So you find them in these warmer climates along the coast where you find water inundating land that has salt. That's the mangrove uh, area, about 160,000 square kilometers of mangroves globally. What other candidates would you use, though, in, uh, you know, if you're not in the wetlands and you want to restore the carbon balance there? Are you and other scientists identifying like, OK, Depending on the area, the geography, et cetera, you know, the non-invasiveness of the plants, you know, you don't want to put the wrong ones in. Right. Is anyone building up a library of, you know, natural ways and natural plants and, and other, you know, creatures to, uh, to restore carbon balance in places that need it? Yeah, you bet. There's a whole industry, if you will, that is, you know, concentrated on carbon sequestration and, and one of the ecosystems globally, again, that's most effective in, in carbon sequestration are wetlands. And whether they're fresh water or salt water, the soils and the plants of, in wetland areas are very intense areas of carbon sequestration. And we have now you know, ideas of nature-based solutions, ecological engineering, engineering with nature, this whole idea of engineering landscapes to form wetlands, to, to expand wetland areas and provide this ecosystem service 
the service that these ecosystems provide that store carbon. And so it's, I call it ecosystem design because you're designing landscapes with the purpose of actually enhancing the carbon sequestration potential and they're contributing how nature can help clean uh, the air and the atmosphere. Hmm, very interesting. Okay. And it's a well, whole industry. Good. I mean, you've got engineering firms and mitigation banking where, you know, you want to expand a, a parking lot or a mall in one area and you mitigate that by building and expanding wetlands in another area. You know, that's one major industry that's 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 developed. And then you have major, you know, incentives relative to farmland to reduce flooding. And these farmlands are being, you know, restored back to some of their natural wetland landscapes. And that reduces nutrient runoff from agricultural lands. It also enhances carbon storage. So, you know, it's really interesting uh, to see these industries that are you know developing uh, and a large part of it is because of this awareness which you can start to monetize that these ecosystems are help cleaning our air and it's and it really is quite fascinating just in the last 10 years how these industries have expanded well very good uh, what's the yeah. best place for people to find out more about your work yeah so at lsu you know we have our lab has a website actually rtwilly at lsu.edu is one of the easiest ways to get in touch with our our work and again by the department of oceanography and coastal science at lsu go to that website and there's actually myself and several other scientists scientists who are all working on this carbon, blue carbon, you know, enterprise, if you will, and how wetlands contribute to that around the world. So I, I appreciate the time and very much to, to share some of this experience with you. Well, very good, Robert. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Before you stop listening, ask yourself, what are one or two useful things you heard on this podcast that can help you overcome food and fertilizer shortages? skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. Please like and subscribe and tell your friends and family about their Surviving Hard Times podcast. We're all going to need help now and in the near future.